Greetings from Bermuda, this is BDA Limey and welcome to Gloomhaven. Okay, the basics, grab and go, light on your feet. Okay, so we've got multiple tutorials. Okay, all right, let's just go through them. Uh, in Gloomhaven, you control a party of mercenaries, each equipped with a deck of ability cards. So these cards are how your mercenaries will explore the dungeons, fight enemies, and loot treasure. At the beginning of each round, the first thing to do is to select two cards for each mercenary to use on their turn. In this tutorial, the Brute has just three cards at his disposal, uh, highlighted on the left. Uh, grab and go, trample, and provoking roar. Uh, provoking Roar is grayed out to indicate that it is currently discarded for the sake of the tutorial. But for now, let's just select the two cards that Brute has available. Okay, so Trample. See how the question mark next to the Brute's portrait at the top of the screen has changed into a number. Uh, this shows his initiative. So the number next to the first card that you select determines the character's initiative for the round. The lower the number, the earlier in the round each character will act. Since there are no other characters visible right now, it will be immediately able to turn anyhow. Okay, then select grab and go. Uh, and then end selection. Okay, so it doesn't matter which order we click them in. Uh, okay, now it's the brute's turn. Time to choose some actions. So each half of a card represents an action comprised of one or more abilities. You get to use two actions per turn, and you can pick any of the four card halves on the left to use as your first action but you must then use the opposite side of the other card for your second action. So for example, here you can choose either the top half of Trample uh, for attack three with Pierce two, uh, and the bottom half of Grab and Go for a move four, or the bottom half of Trample, move four, jump, attack two, uh, and the top half of Grab and Go, one. There's nothing for the Brute to do in this room, so you'll want to move through the door to see what lies beyond with a move ability. Grab and goes bottom half, lets the brute move four hexes, which is enough to get through the door. Let's use that. Okay, so click on that. Uh, and then, uh, so four spaces, one, two, three takes us to the door. Open the door. I have one point of movement left afterwards, which it's like we do. Okay, this room contains your first enemy, a bandit guard. Uh, like play characters, monsters also select actions for their turn. Let's find out what this bandit is planning to do by hovering over his portrait. Okay, so move one, attack three. Uh, whereas play characters get two actions per turn, monsters only get one, albeit often with multiple abilities within. AJ, so how are you doing today? Um, I have played a lot of the board game version of, uh, of this. Uh, so I've played the entire board game campaign with two of my friends on Tabletop Simulator. Um, yeah, we started playing the board game like a week before the pandemic hit. So we got one game in in person and then we had to play the rest uh, using Tabletop Simulator. So yeah, so I've got a lot of experience with, with Gloomhaven. Uh, this is the first time jumping back into the digital version, uh, though since they released the 1.0 version last week. So it's been in early access for a couple of years, um, but they hadn't added the full campaign from the board game uh, to the game uh, until last week. So yeah, my plan is to uh, play through the campaign on here, maybe. Um, we'll see, it's it's pretty meaty. I mean, it took us, it took us a year to get through the whole campaign. Um, I think there's like about a hundred scenarios altogether. You don't play all of them because there's various branching paths you can take and do uh, so you end up doing different scenarios. Uh, but yeah, it's it's a pretty meaty game. Um, so yeah, I, I, I picked up the game in fact, just before uh, we started playing the board game version, just as a way to learn the rules, uh, and found it super helpful for that, even though it was still just in early access at the time. Um, but now it's, yeah, it's basically, it's it's done and dusted. Um, so yeah, I've been looking forward to uh, to checking it out. Okay, and apparently it is a it is a very good adaptation of the board game as well. Uh, it seems to be getting a lot of praise, which is uh, which is really nice. Okay, so uh, yeah, monsters only get one action 
will be often lost full abilities within. Okay. Uh, the bandit has a lower initiative than the brute and would have acted before the brute this round had he been visible. Uh, as it is currently the brute's turn, however, he will get to finish his turn before the bandit can act. So let's get the brute close enough to use the attack on Trample's top half as his second action for the turn. Okay, so yeah, we had a move four. We moved three hexes to the door, so we've got one movement left. Um, so we can finish that off now. Now that you've finished using grab and go for the turn, it's discarded and no longer usable until you return it to your hand via resting. More on that later. And now let's attack. So top half of trample, attack three with pierce two. And confirm targets. So whenever you attack, an attack modifier is drawn from your character's modifier deck and that value is applied to your attack. So in this case, you can see above the bandit guard that a plus zero modifier was drawn. So your attack still just deals its base value of three damage. So yeah, in the board game version, you've got like a deck of, uh, I don't know how many cards there are, about 15 cards, I think. Uh, and they vary from uh, minus two to plus two modifiers. Um, and as you go through the game and you level up your character, you get the opportunity to, to switch those attack modifier cards out as well. Um, Okay, for this tutorial we will only have plus zero modifiers in effect to keep things simple. Okay, and turn. Bandit Guard's turn. Now it's the Bandit's turn. As we saw in his card earlier, he tends to move, and then perform a melee attack for three damage. So yeah, move one space, attack three. Uh, however, as he's already within melee range of the Brute, he will simply forgo moving and get straight to the attack. Ouch! Our monsters always take damage directly to their hit points. Whenever a player character is damaged, you are presented with three options. First, you can simply take the damage to your character's hit point total. Uh, however, if this character is reduced to zero, this character is exhausted, which means they can no longer act in this scenario. If all of your mercenaries are exhausted, you will lose the scenario. So yeah, in, for the tutorial here, we've only got one character, but normally in a game, uh, you would have, well, you'd, you'd have one for every person playing. So the board game supports uh, one to four players. Um, we played it with three. In this digital version, uh, I guess we'll be able to pick however many characters we want in our party, but then we will have to play uh, the hands for each character. Uh, instead of taking the damage though, uh, we could choose to burn two discarded ability cards. Uh, if we burn a card, it can be no longer recovered by resting. That's a pretty, uh, a pretty extreme way. You only, you only want to do that if basically if you're going to die or if you're going to become exhausted, you take the damage. Uh, and if we were to burn two of the Brutes cards here, he would not have enough cards left for the following turn and thus we'd become exhausted. Um, yeah, if you run out of cards uh, in your deck that aren't exhausted basically, uh, then you become exhausted as well. Uh, finally, you can choose to burn one available card. This option is grayed out as all of the Brutes cards are currently discarded. Okay. It is usually wise just to take the damage over burning cards if possible, lest you run out of cards to finish the scenario. Um, so for now, let's just opt to take three damage as the Brute has enough health to survive. Okay. So, receive damage. Bandit's turn is now over. As he was the last character to attack, it's the end of the round and a new round begins. Okay, during ability card selection, if you have at least two discarded cards, then you may perform a long or a short rest to recover some of them. Uh, all of the Brute's ability cards are currently discarded. Long rest doesn't count as a card. Uh, yeah, this is just a, another action that you can choose to take. Um, uh, so as such, he will have to rest to continue. So there's a difference between discarded cards and burnt cards. Um, as it mentioned, you can burn cards uh, to prevent incoming damage, uh, but some more powerful abilities on your cards will also require them to be burnt. Uh, and yeah, usually there isn't a way of getting burnt cards back. Uh, some classes do have a way of bringing them back, uh, but usually not. Okay, short rest, however, will burn one of your discarded cards at random, losing it for the rest of the scenario, uh, but will recover all other discarded cards before continuing your turn as normal. You can recover cards to use immediately this turn. Long Rest, however, takes up the whole turn and is used instead of selecting two cards. 
uh, and it gives us an initiative of 99. We will have to act last, basically. Um, however, you not only get to choose which card to burn instead of it being random, but all characters will perform a heal two action and refresh all item cards. We haven't talked about it yet. Uh, choosing to long rest here would be certain death if the bandit draws an attack card for the round, as the brute has neither health nor cards to spare, so let's choose the short rest. Okay. Yep. Okay, grab and go has randomly been selected as the card to burn. Once per short rest, you can opt to redraw the random card uh, at the cost of one damage, but with the brute only on one health, this isn't an option. So we are burning grab and go. So yep, that is gone forever. Uh, in exchange, Trample and Provoking Roar have been returned to our hand and are available to use again. So yeah, we'll, we'll basically, uh, there's just two for the purposes of this uh, tutorial, but usually um, the heroes have a, a hand of between 8 and 10 cards. Uh, and so every turn you're choosing two of those to play. Um, and then basically when you run out of cards in your hand, that's when you have to choose to do either a long or a short rest to get your discarded cards back into your hand again. Um, so it, it's not like a, a deck builder where your hand goes into a discard pile at the end of your turn. Um, okay, both Brute and the Bandit are near death, so it's crucial to go as early as possible in the round to get in the first attack. Remember, the first card you choose determines the Brute's initiative. So let's choose Provoking Roar, which is initiative 10, uh, to maximize the chance that the Brute is first. Okay, so Provoking Roar. And then trample. Okay, now that we're in the same room as the bandit, we can see that enemies draw their ability cards each round after the players. So you won't know what they'll be doing or what their initiatives will be until this point in each round. Uh, it appears the bandit was planning to once again use a move and attack, but because you chose to attack quickly with an initiative of 10, uh, he won't have those active until after the brute's turn due to a slower initiative of 50. Okay. Uh, so, again, attack three, pierce two. Confirm. Plus zero modifier. And we kill him. Uh, do you see that gold on the floor that the bandit left behind? To pick it up, you need to use a loot ability. The one important rule of Gloomhaven to bear in mind is that you don't automatically loot treasure unless you finish your turn on it. If you want it, make sure to pick it up before the scenario ends. Loot abilities can also appear on ability cards, but the easiest way to collect it here is to end your turn on the hex that contains the gold pile. So let's move the brute onto it. Uh, but wait, look at Provoking Roar. It doesn't have a move ability on the bottom half section, so how can the brute reach the gold? This is where default actions come in handy. So to the left and the right of the uh, central initiative value, so here, uh, are two small default action buttons. So these allow the character to perform a melee attack for two instead of the top action, uh, or a move of two instead of the bottom action. So basically on every card that we have, we always have the ability to pick an attack two uh, instead of what is ever on the top half, or a move two instead of whatever is on the bottom half. So we're gonna do the move two, we're gonna move on to the gold. Then we need to move one hex for the brute to reach the gold, we can skip the remaining movement. In turn. Great work. Right. Not only did you vanquish the lone bandit guard, you've even managed to pick up a few pieces of gold. Uh, and in the in the campaign, gold is persistent uh, over the scenarios, uh, and you use it to buy equipment and uh, all kinds of other stuff as well. You do want to get as much gold as you can. With the basics covered, it's now time to introduce you to some slightly more dangerous scenarios. Welcome to your first training mission. You've learned the basics, but now you must help the gravely wounded brute deal with the bandit archer elite, a stronger enemy with greater stats than normal. With only a single hit point remaining, any amount of damage getting through will cause the Brute to become exhausted. As such, you will have to avoid any incoming damage by burning cards. For the sake of training, the attack modifier decks will all be plus zeros, 
so don't worry about those for now. Your objectives to start are... Take down the archer with a single attack. Loot the gold she drops. Now surely you can handle that. Surely. Okay. So, two traps. So if we can uh, push the archer onto these traps, uh, they will do one damage. Uh, I guess if she pushes us onto them, they'll do one damage to us. Uh, but what are the cards have we got now? So shield bash, attack four. Stun, uh, which would stop her from acting. Uh, shield, uh, shield one on ourself on the bottom. Spare dagger, attack three, uh, so that's a ranged attack. I probably don't want to do that because we get a penalty if we use a ranged attack when we're adjacent to an enemy. Uh, or attack two on the bottom. Overwhelming assault, attack six. Uh, and that little two is... Um, Experience points, uh, which again would matter in the campaign for, for leveling up, uh, and then grab and go. Okay, so we want to kill her with uh, with one hit, so we're going to use Overwhelming Assault. Uh, I'm actually surprised it's, it's allowing us to, to do it all ourselves. Uh, we would like to make sure we go before she does though, so we're going to pick Shield Bash just for the fact that it's uh, Initiative 15. That's as fast as we can possibly go. Um, so that and that. Selection. Oh my god, she had 14. Are you serious? Uh, okay, so she moves. One space. Attacks for two. Uh, range of three. And then creates a three damage trap in an adjacent hex closest to us. Okay. Okay, so we can't receive the damage because we'll die. Uh, so we got to burn one of our available cards. Uh, which doesn't matter. Uh, we'll burn that one. It's a trap. Uh, but now we get to do our attack six. Which is enough to kill her. Bosh! a powerful card, but such power comes at a cost. Actions like Overwhelming Assault's top half, with the flaming card icon in the corner, cause the card to be burned once used, meaning you can't use it again in this scenario. Time to grab that gold. Uh, okay, yeah, so I missed that. Well, that's fine. Yeah, so uh, the, more, the more powerful abilities, uh, yeah, will burn when you Sorry, down here, right? This one also has a burn on it. Uh, so we can use this for a move again uh, to get on the gold. Good job. With no enemies left and your objectives complete, the scenario normally would have ended already, leaving that chest behind. However, for the sake of training, I'm going to set you another objective. Loot the chest. Before you rush headlong into that trap, you might want to heal up a bit first. I'd suggest taking a long rest, which will let you heal too and recover enough discarded cards, allowing you to withstand the two damage from the trap and reach the chest. Good idea. A long rest. Select a discarded card to burn. See that rest is in the way. Perform one rest. Uh, okay, so we'll burn that. Then we will move on to the trap. So they're the only two cards that we've got left. use this I think yeah I think traps interrupt our movement uh, so we 
receive one damage. That's fine. Oh, okay, so they don't interrupt our move. We just take damage as we go across them. Uh, and select a remaining action and skip it to end your turn. Okay. Because we finished our turn on the chest, we loot it, same as with the gold. It's a striding during your movement, add a plus two move to a single movement. of striding will come in handy next time you need a little extra mobility. Right. On to the next part of your training. So, you've learned about the basic attack and move abilities, but this time we're going to use some abilities with additional effects. A move action with a jump effect will help you here. Jump allows you to cross tiles containing obstacles or enemies, and even move over traps without triggering them provided you can reach an empty hex to land on. Those boots of striding you picked up last time can be used to increase a move ability by two hexes. That'll enable you to get up close and personal this turn. You don't have the damage to take her out in one go, but if you act fast, you could apply the disarm condition to her before she can attack. Your objectives for this first round are Use a jump movement to get across the traps unscathed. Disarm the archer before she attacks. Okay. So, Provoking Roar has disarm on it. Uh, Leaping Cleave has jump on it. So, we'll do those and we'll do Provoking Roar first so we go as quickly as possible. This time we do beat her. Good. Uh, all right, move three and jump. And, uh, okay, use item total the displayed item to add their effects to the movement. So, yeah. Uh, okay, so then we can move five spaces instead of three. And because we've got jump, we'll, we'll get caught by the traps. So we can go there. Uh, we actually have some extra movement. Can I really get all the way over there? Surely not. Okay, uh, then do an attack two with disarm. And yeah, so the disarm uh, disarm character cannot perform any attack abilities. And the disarm condition is removed at the end of the affected character's next turn. You did also it. created an element. Not only did you get a decent hit in with provoking roar, but thanks to the disarm condition you applied, the archer couldn't attack for the turn. She's low on health now, so you should be able to finish her off. Your objectives this turn are kill the archer, jump over the traps, and loot the chest. I want you to achieve both this round. A short rest allows you to recover discarded cards to immediately use this turn. Long resting takes the whole turn. And it's used instead of selecting two cards, so not going to help us. Uh, yeah, because we need we have no cards, in fact. So, short rest. Uh, an overwhelming assault. Uh, is that okay? Move three and jump. Okay, so we're going to use the same cards again. Going before her. Uh, but this time we want to do the attack first. And move three with jump. Turn, loot the chest. Find a healing potion. Rest, stab, and a jump right onto the chest. Nicely done. That potion will surely be of use in the missions to come. 
To be a successful guild master, you need to pay close Surrounded. attention to enemy actions and try to plan your moves around them. This looks like a pretty rough scenario, I've got to say. Just one simple objective for you this time. Don't get attacked. You'll have to start over if an enemy manages to land a hit. You'll need to escape this room by opening the door in front of the brute. But remember that enemies in the next room will also get to act this round. My advice? Act quickly. Looking carefully at what actions the enemies are going to take. I've set it up so that you should be able to find a safe place to stand, out of reach from all enemies. Let's see if you can survive. Okay. So I take from that that we need to go through... Don't get attacked for two rounds. We need to go through this door now. Um... Yeah. Not knowing what's in there, though. Okay, what have we got? We can roll attack to disarm. Any enemy who targets one of your adjacent allies, uh, attack this round targets you with the attack instead. Okay, so that's no good. It's only us. Move three and jump. We don't have the boots this time. And a move four. So I think, so I can maximize where I can move, I'm going to use the move four rather than a move three. Uh, I want to get out of here quickly, so we're going to go early as well. So, move four, two to the door. Okay, just one guy there. That's a shame though, because we can't get to him. Uh, okay, what are they doing? The archer is moving one and then attacking three with a range of three. And all the bandit guards are moving two and attacking two. Okay. So he can get here. So if we move forward into this room, he's going to be able to hit us. So that's no good. We could stay here. Uh, but the archer can move there. Then she's got a range three, one, two, three. We are out of range from that. And he'll move one, two, one, two. Yeah, we're actually safe where we are. So I'm going to skip movement. And I'm going to skip attack. All we've got to do is not get attacked for two rounds. Um, yeah, done. Excellent. You eluded the enemies in both rooms. Opening a door will always add more enemies to deal with. So make sure you're prepared for that when opening doors in future scenarios. Just one more round of bandit dodging to complete the mission. You'll find it tricky to locate a safe space this time. Perhaps you could try preventing an attack to survive? Okay, but a short rest then. Um, I don't know what the enemies are going to do until we've done our thing anyway. Is our move four? Sure. Move three. B. Main thing is keeping out of the range of the archer. Although that should be easy if we head in this way. I think what we want to do is we want to get as far in here as we can and then we want to stun. Uh, we want to disarm him. So provoking roar. Move three and jump. Move three, push one. Uh. That actually would be better. Like that. Possibly, depending on what they're planning on doing. Both move to an attack. We are going first. Okay, so the archer is the problem. Move two, so she'll go to there. One, two, three. So as long as we're here, we're fine. We can get there. And move to attack two. Yes, that's fine. So we will go here. One, two, three. Around the back. 
And then attack two and disarm. Oh, okay. Uh, sorry, we're still doing the push here. Uh, skip push. Not push. Attack two and disarm. Yeah, if they had not been a, a moving as well, then in a, in, instead of disarming, what we could have done is, is yeah, use this to push him one hex away from us. Um, and then wouldn't have been able to attack. Uh, but because they are moving and attacking, uh, we couldn't do that. Excellent stuff. You're well on your way to becoming a professional. And how about that disarm? Pretty powerful condition, eh? That and a nice low initiative of 10 makes provoking Roar a really nifty ability for getting out of nasty scrapes. One more test, and then I think you'll be ready to start exploring the world and recruiting mercenaries to our guild. Let's talk about attack modifiers. So far in your training, characters have always drawn a plus zero attack modifier meaning their attacks have always dealt the exact damage value specified on the cards. This is not normally the case. In real scenarios, for each attack, the character will draw an attack modifier which influences the damage dealt. These can increase the damage by plus one, plus two, or times two. Times two. <laughs> decrease by minus one, minus two, or times zero, or leave the value unaffected as you've seen with a plus zero. You can see the contents of a character's modifier deck by hovering over any character. Note that unlike player characters, all monsters share a single attack modifier deck. It's nothing worse than getting hit by a, a critical hit for double damage by an enemy that can just one-shot you immediately. For this training scenario, these archers have just two attack modifiers remaining in their decks. Oh, good. Times two and times zero. We want them to draw the times zero to deal no damage. And we're going to give them disadvantage to ensure that. Ranged attacks have disadvantage when their target is on an adjacent hex. This forces the attacker to draw two modifier cards instead of just one. And the worst result is selected. As these archers only have two modifiers remaining, if they attack with disadvantage, they will draw both, but be forced to choose the times zero over the times two as the worst result, dealing no damage. You can see when disadvantage will apply from the flashing purple symbol next to the health bar. You can only disadvantage one archer here, so kill the other with a ranged attack. Should be easy as the Brute's attack modifier deck is full of plus ones for this mission. You can thank me later. Your objectives are, stand next to one of the archers to give her disadvantage, kill the other archer with a ranged attack. Right. So, spare dagger attack three, range three. We know we've got a plus one modifier in our decks. So that's gonna do four damage, which is gonna be enough to kill. Um. And then we just gotta get next to one, two, three. Uh, that will do it. So we could take leaping cleave. Doesn't really matter. Dagger. Cleave. Go. Okay, they're not gonna get to attack. Go first. So move three with jump. We'll go next to that archer. We've heard disadvantage. Attack three, range three. You not have disadvantage because we are not next to her. We drew the plus one modifier, so that kills. And now because she's not moving, she's just doing an attack. Um, See how she the drew both the times zero and times two modifiers. Disadvantage forced her to draw two attack modifiers and use the worst one. You also saw how your attack with Spare Dagger drew a plus one, thus dealing four damage total to take down the other archer. Your final objectives are... 
Kill the remaining archer. Loot the chest. Maybe short rest, get our cards back. Um, burn, leap, and cleave, okay. Uh, right, so we got another ranged attack. Wait, loot the chest. Two, wait, 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 wait. Oh, okay, we're at disadvantage, but all of our cards in our attack modifier deck are plus one, so disadvantage doesn't matter for us. We can do spare dagger and grab and grab and go. Uh, and we can use the top. Um, so yeah, the, the flashing symbol under our health bar shows us that we're at disadvantage, but like he says, he, he stacked our deck with plus one, so that doesn't matter. Then we can do a move four and get to the chest. Nice. A heater shield should help you soak up some damage. You finished your basic training missions. Time to introduce you to the other mercs and get you exploring. A voiceover. Let's begin looking more closely at what each individual character can do. In this scenario, the brute has two level one living burn elites to deal with. It means their stats will be greater than their level zero counterparts. Once the stats are combined with a base ability card drawn for the monsters for the monster class's turn. Resulting in the cards you see and the monsters' cards for the round are revealed. Monster stats are combined with a base ability card drawn for the monster class's turn. Expect them to move a bit further and attack a bit harder, especially as they're elites. Okay. Notice how they both have an innate shield one effect. Uh, so that's the shield at the end of their health bar. Each point of shield prevents one damage from incoming attacks. However, an amount of shield can be ignored if targeted with an attack with Pierce. I have it on good authority that these living burns are going to attack more than once each this turn. You are low on cards and won't be able to afford to burn any cards. So surviving here will require some shielding of your own. By the way, while these enemy shields are in an innate persistent effect, normally active bonuses granting abilities such as shield are accompanied by a round or persistent duration icon. So yeah, a lot of the time shield effects just apply for that round. Your objectives are kill the living bones using an attack with pierce, apply some shield, use your healing potion. Okay, so. Uh, that would be trample. Attack three, pierce two. So yeah, pierce ignores the shield, so we could kill this living bones here with it. Um... And then we want to apply shield using the bottom, so it'll be shield bash. So shield bash, and trample. Move four, attack two. Target one enemy with all attacks. Uh, now what is it that shows they have multiple attacks? In a target three, so they can actually hit three. <laughs> they're gonna hit the card, they're gonna hit both hitters three times each, two damage each turn. So I use my healing potion, uh, apply some shield. going to reduce the incoming damage to one point each. Uh, so we'll be getting three from each of them. So yeah, hence we got a kill. There we 
got a plus one. Shoot. Uh, okay, we've got to hope he gets a negative modifier now. Uh, receive damage. Eek. Receive damage. Oh, shoot. Really? Oh, we got a shield. Wait, I didn't even see that. Okay, okay, so I can select it, right. Yeah, so it's an item uh, that can be used once. So then that changes to receive zero, okay. So yeah, so we had shield applied, but we also had an item, a shield. Um, which saved us. Okay. Uh, perhaps you could use the old push and trap combo. Note that the shield only prevents damage from attacks. It doesn't do anything against direct damage, such as traps. Okay, this is a damage three. That's a damage three. If we can push him into both. given a choice anyway. Uh, okay, so attack three, push two. So that's, yeah, that's fine. We'll do, actually, we'll only do two damage. We need something else on the bottom. Uh, we got an attack two on the bottom here, which is unusual. Most uh, attack actions are on the top of the card. Uh, usually the bottom actions are some kind of defensive ability or a movement ability. Um, but yeah, if we do this, we can attack two on the bottom. Then we can attack three on the top and push two. We go before him, which we did. So we got to attack uh, two first. He's still next to us. Uh, yeah, that is going to do it. The shield blocks one and takes one damage. Then attack three with push two. Plus two damage. And push onto uh, the trap. Okay, and if you push him through two, it does trigger both of them. Save the brute yet again. I hear he's decided that adventuring alone is not working out for him, so he's agreed to be the first mercenary in your guild. Let's get out of this dusty crypt and see who else we can recruit. Meet the scoundrel. She's incredibly nimble and mobile, not to mention able to combo off huge amounts of melee damage when things line up just right. Let's help her out of this sticky situation. Firstly, you need to kill three archers this round before they can attack. Jeez, <laughs> okay. Uh, you'll certainly need something that can hit more than one target at a time. So, what have we got? Throwing knives, uh, attack two, range three, target two enemies. Um, and loot two on the bottom. So that picks up all gold within a radius of two hexes, if we play that. Uh, but it's got that little burn symbol in the bottom right corner, so if we play it, uh, this card is burn the rest of the scenario. Smoke bomb, uh, invisible. Uh, on your next attack while invisible, double the value of the attack and gain two experience. Uh, we also have a pull ability, a range of three. So we could use that to pull this enemy here onto this trap here, uh, which will kill. That seems pretty good, actually. The health of these got, they've both got two, right? Yeah. And then Thief Snack, disarm one adjacent trap. Get to experience uh, on the bottom again, and usually uh, attack three. Okay, so we are going to pick throwing knives or the bottom pull two. Uh, sorry, throwing knives for the top attack two, range three, targeting two enemies, and smoke bomb for the bottom pull two, range three, and that should kill all. So, start with this. All. There. And then 
throwing knives. Target that and that. So, uh, target two. Feels good picking off multiple targets in a single turn, doesn't it? One last objective, loot at least five piles of gold this round. Times the top half of a card allows you to move two. Loot abilities pick up all of the gold within the radius specified by the value, so you work out where you need to stand and get looting. Okay, so short rest to bring our cards back. Uh, I'm going to assume that's all right. Am I? So. I'm hoping for the tutorial they're not going to give us a suggest a card to burn that will actually stop us completing the scenario. Uh, okay, so bottom of throwing knives is loot two. So if we stand, oh god, we got to loot everything. If we stand here, we can loot that. Uh, that's loot one. Wait, loot at least five tiles. Okay, we don't have to loot them all. Three, okay. So, uh, loot two on the bottom. Oh yeah, so we'd look for a move on the top. That was the hint, right? Uh, so quick hands, let's move two. So we can move to here and then uh, loot two. So 10. 10 for the bottom. 64 for the top. Always useful when you're playing this game to reiterate to yourself, okay, I'm picking this card for the top and then this card for the bottom because it's very easy to end up picking two cards that you plan on using uh, abilities that are both at the top or both at the bottom uh, and then kicking yourself and having to improvise something. So uh, we do the move first, move there. Skip the attack, There's nothing to attack anyway, and then loot two. 12 gold, that's a lot of gold. Nice. Let me just take care of that gold for you. Your assistance in this scenario, the scoundrel has agreed to join the guild. That means we've got enough mercenaries now for a proper mission. Whoa. Meet the Spellweaver, a powerful but fragile magic wielder who can harness the natural elements of the world. Good thing we found her when we did. That's a lot of bandits. Get her out of this mess. You'll need to harness the power of the elements infused in the battlefield. The elemental infusions display can be seen on the right of the screen, indicating which magical elements are available for consuming. In this scenario, the ice element is already infused. Elements are normally infused for two rounds through actions with elemental symbols on them, available for consumption after the turn in which they're infused. Uh, so yeah, so there's, there's multiple elements. There's like fire, wind, ice, uh, and so on. And yeah, usually you will play an ability that will uh, infuse it. Uh, you then are not allowed to use that element. Uh, usually if, if there's an element available to use, you can use it to increase the power of a, an ability that you use on one of your cards. You can't use it on the same turn that it's created. So you gotta wait till the following turn. So this round we must consume the ice element to augment freezing Nova's attack, killing as many bandits as you can. Survive the round by using a jump move to get out of reach. Okay, so Freezing Nova, uh, all right. Let's attack two, target all adjacent enemies and immobilize them. And if we can consume uh, ice, then that increases our attack to three. Um, so that's, yeah, pretty good. This is the ice avail element available here. Uh, so it's currently strong, so it's available to be used for the rest of this round at the whole of the next round. So yeah, elements go from strong to uh, waning, I think it is, uh, and then unavailable. So we do that for the top half, because it's told us we need to, and then we need to get out of range. So uh, move eight with jump sounds pretty good for getting out of range. Let's do that. Actually, we are going before the bandits, so do that. Uh, activate that. So attack three for all adjacent enemies. Go. Okay, still three alive. 
what are they actually doing? Move three, attack two. Okay. Where can we work? Hang on. Wait. Use a jump move to. Yeah, fine. But where can we move to? They're doing a move three, attack two. Uh. Oh right, I can hide in here. And then only one of them is going to be able to get me. But I hope he draws a negative attack. Oh he, no, he can't move. They're all um. We mobilize them all as well, so that's fine. So yeah, we can easily get out of the way. Yeah, and skip movement. And turn. Consuming the ice element, freezing Nova dealt three base damage instead of two, knocking out three bandits, plus applying the immobilized conditions to the country. So after you is pretty darn powerful. Right, the wind also infused the air element for you to use later if need be. You may have also noticed with only three unburnt cards remaining, the spell weaver will be exhausted after the next round is over. So you cannot return the burned cards via resting. Fortunately, the spell weaver has a very powerful trick up her sleeve. Many of her powerful cards may burn after usage, but the top half of Reviving Aether allows her to return all of her burned cards to her hand. Getting the timing right on this one-time recovery per scenario of all burned cards is key to using Spellweaver well. Kill the remaining bandit guards. Uh, using Reviving Aether. So. Short rest. Uh, no, we do not want to burn Reviving Aether. Uh, do we want to burn that though? Oh, but it's fine. Yeah, it's fine because then we use Reviving Aether to recover all our burned cards anyway. Uh, so, God, what are, I don't know what they're doing yet. Got two cards to use, so go. Move to attack to strengthen self. Um, I forget what strengthen does. It might give them advantage on their attacks. Which means they draw two attack modifiers and they pick the best one. No, that's advantage. Uh, yeah. I don't remember. Do not remember. Uh, we can do attack two, range two, or... I think we can shoot over obstacles. Four. Oh, I must have drawn a plus two. Uh, I did draw a plus two. Okay, good. Cover all our burned cards. In our turn. It's in dark as well. So yeah, air is waning now. So it was strong last go, waning this go, and if we don't use it this go, it disappears. Okay, two of them to kill. Uh, can I just run next to them and freezing Nova again? Attack two on both of them. I think I probably can. As long as they don't go before me. Which they did not. Okay, move eight with jump. Next to both of them. Using uh, skip the extra movement and then freezing Nova. Oh shoot! No, one's left alive. I screwed up. That's bad. What are they doing? 
Eek. Uh, I'm gonna burn two discarded cards. So I can still go next go. One, two. Fire orbs. Is that supposed to happen? Uh, attack two, range three. Yeah, let's. Uh, that is. I just. Even that's not guaranteed to hit, is it? Attack three, range three. It's better. That would infuse fire as well. So. Let's use this to move two, so we don't have disadvantage on our attack. And then use that, Oops, skip the rest of the movement, and then use this to attack him. Okay, you. Maybe I didn't screw up. Helping her out of that bind, the Spellweaver has agreed to join our guild. As you saw, her abilities can be incredibly potent, but she can be a difficult character to work with due to the complexity of her tactics. Meet the Tinkerer, he's a great support character to have on a team. You can also take on multiple enemies in a pinch. Looking at all the skeletons, I'd say this counts as one. Currently he's wounded. And will take one damage at the start of his turns. So you want to heal him as soon as possible with that minor health potion. Looking at where the enemies in the room are, I'd advise you to go as late as possible this round. Sometimes it's better to go slow and let the enemies come to you so that you aren't at risk of being attacked. Then you can use one of the Tinker's famous area of effect attacks to deal some serious damage to multiple enemies at once. You can recognise such abilities by the hex ship patterns on the ability card showing you the shape of the area it will target. Okay, so if we want to go late, then we would want to pick Ink Bomb first, so our initiative number is as high as possible. Um, and we'll be using that for the top Ink Bomb attack. So it targets uh, three hexes uh, in a pattern like that. Uh, attack four, and one of the hexes must be within range three of us. Uh, and it will also infuse dark, which is what that little symbol below it means. And um, we get one experience point for every enemy targeted. So bottom ability, what else would be useful? Uh, attack five range two. Uh, that might be good if they've come in range by then. Or move six. Uh, yeah, we don't really want to move six, so let's do the toxic bolt. But ink bomb first, so we've got a high initiative. Move three, attack one, target two. Okay, so they've only got melee attacks. They cannot actually close all the way to us. Oh, he's wounded. Oh, I forgot to use his friggin' potion. doesn't make me lose the scenario. Uh, you may have noticed that if you use a heal ability when... Oh no, we, we have an opportunity because it triggers at the start of our turn. You may have noticed that if you use a heal ability when wounded, the character not only recovers hit points but loses the wound condition. Healing can also remove a poison condition, but in that case you will only remove the condition and regain no hit points. Okay, sadly they are out of range for this. Uh, but they are in range for this, so... Uh, oh yeah, this is showing us the... Can we rotate the... Like if I wanted these two and this one. Way to rotate that uh, targeting thing. Doesn't seem to be. Right. Okay. 
Must be a one. There's some reason why I can't do Well, not all day. Okay, that was all we had to do this round. Uh, can we even, we can't even move further away, can we? We are right at the back of the room, I think. Uh, but if we go here, uh, it makes it slightly harder for them to hit us. We can the one can get there with a move of two. This one needs a move of three to get here. Ping bomb was pretty good. I'll leave you to finish off the rest of these bad guys. So you know that you can take the shape of an area effect by pressing R. I did not. Okay, now I do. Tell me that earlier. Okay, short rest. Uh, sure. We only got two cards we can use, so I guess we're picking those two. Oh, hang on though. Uh, do I want to go slow? What are we going to do here? We want to go fast. They are. There we go. Confirm targets. They're all dead. Move six and move on to some loop. Why not? guy packs quite the punch, eh? Let's sign him up and look for some paid jobs for the guild to take on. The everyone's favourite walking boulder, the Krakart. Badly outnumbered here, and we'll need to employ some defensive tactics. Let's go over how Retaliate works and see how we can use that to help old Craggy out of this mess. Like Shield, Retaliate is an active bonus that can either last the round or be persistent, usually with a termination condition for the latter. While active, melee attackers will have damage inflicted on them equal to the retaliate value after each attack. Surrounded by this many living bones, a retaliation against any that attack equates to an incredible amount of damage, assuming you can survive the round. Oh, and one last thing, note that earth is infused already. Remember to click the consume icon on the card if you wish to use the element to power up an ability. Okay, so bottom half of opposing strike. Uh, on the next six melee attacks targeting you, gain retaliate two. Uh, and the little uh, kind of diagram below that indicates that on the first one you get nothing. On the second one, second melee attack that targets you, you gain one XP. The third one you gain nothing. The fourth one you gain another XP, and so on. Um, but yeah, XP is not important to us in this tutorial, but it will be once we start the campaign. Uh, and then Avalanche. Attack four in that area of effect. So uh, in this case, because it's a, a melee based area of effect attack, the gray hex is the one where we are standing uh, and the red hexes are the ones that will be targeted by the ability. Uh, and yeah, if we consume earth, we will add one, so we'll make it an attack five will be enough to get through that one shield and the four hit points. So we'll go as fast as we can. They're doing a move three, attack one, and again, okay, they've got target two. We'll be doing two attacks. Okay, so confirm that. Doing move three. Two, three, two, three, two, three. 
Uh, although we're not gonna, well, we're probably not gonna. Oh wait, see that. Now we're gonna kill those. We want to target two, even though it means that enemies are gonna be able to fill in from over here. It's still bad. <laughs> Okay, and we've got a health potion, but we don't need it just yet. Retaliate triggered. I uh, receive damage. us for one, we retaliate for two, he has target two, he hits us again for one, and we retaliate for two. That's four out of the six attacks that we've now retaliated for. Took a fair bit of damage but that was a great result, a well-timed retaliate can be devastatingly powerful. Way you can see the active bonus from the opposing strike is still active. Uh, just look at this Crackheart's portrait at the top of the screen, little pips in the active bo bonus bonuses box. Show you at a glance how many instances remain and you can check the effect text and XP yield by hovering over it. Did you notice how the Living Bones shield didn't prevent any retaliate damage? Just like traps, retaliate damage is not explicitly an attack and as such will deal exactly the amount it says it will, unaffected by shields, modifiers and the like. Okay, finish off the bones and we can get out of here. Uh, so yeah, okay. So the, the greyed out ones are the ones we up, showing us the next one is going to give us 0 XP and the one after that will give us 1. Uh, we need to short rest. Uh, I'm sure. Let's burn that. We've got a lot of cards to choose from. Um, and this can be the trickiest thing I guess playing even uh, even in this version of the game that streamlines so much and you know you don't have to worry about trying to apply the rules to work out where the enemies are going to move and how they're going to attack because uh, the game takes care of all that for you uh, but still then for every character in your party you've got to pick two cards for them um, and that can be quite 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 a bit of thought even just picking two cards for one character can require quite a bit of thought um, Okay, so options, what have we got? Dirt Tornado, attack one, range two, models all enemies and enemy, allies and enemies in the target area. Uh, I'm trying to remember what model does, I can't remember. Okay, we're looking for some kind of attack that will let us maybe hit both. Actually, if we can get next to one and kill one, then we can just let our two remaining charges of Retaliate kill the other one. So we're looking for something that does attack five, I guess. Or attack three, target all adjacent enemies. It's not... Bad. That will be two damage with the shield, but our attack modifier may reduce it further. It's probably worth trying. So we'll do that. Uh, and we can use anything. Can use anything to move in there. If two all adjacent allies and enemies suffer one damage. It's not going to go through their shield anyway, so that doesn't really matter. Ah, uh, that doesn't let us move. Yeah, it doesn't really matter. Why is this? Oh right, this is still active, that's why it's up here. Uh, it doesn't matter. Let's just do... So we want to do unstable upheaval. But we'll do that and that. We will use uh, that, sure. 
three, skip the rest of our movement, and then attack three, target all the an enemy. Okay, so they're both down to zero, so uh, both down to two, so retaliate will finish them off. All adjacent allies capability, why is it saying skip ability? Okay, and we may as well use that to heal, why not? Gold, because we finished our turn on the gold. Ooh, four. Eek. Taliate killed him there. Guess he got a big attack modifier, did he? Uh, yeah, Living Burns drew a plus two attack modifier. <laughs> It kills him. Well done, that looked like an unmanageable situation at first, but as you saw, if you play your cards right, you can navigate even the trickiest situations. Meet the final member of your starting roster, the Mind Thief. What she may lack in physical prowess is made up for in her ability to control the actions of enemies and summon allies to the battlefield. Summons autonomously attack, sum summons autonomously act directly before the turn of their summoner. Always performing a move X, attack Y action, where X and Y are their base stats. As the Mind Thief was out hunting demons, you were about to face a more serious enemy, the Night Demon. Oh yeah, these guys are nasty. These harrowing creatures have an inherent ability to give disadvantage to all attacks targeting them, making them often tricky to deal with. So remember, disadvantage means we will draw two attack modified cards and we'll pick the worst one. Perhaps you can try taking them down with a non-attack source of direct damage. Summon an ally, kill a night demon. Enemies will prioritize your summon if you're at the same range. Use this to your advantage. Okay, lots of cards to look at. Um, kill one of them. Attack four, range five, disarm. One, two, three, four, five. That will do the job, basically, immediately. Uh, so where is our... Okay, so our summons are the higher initiative cards. Uh, and it's always the top of the card. All right, I think. So actually, we've only got one. We've only got Gnawing Horde. Uh, so if we have to summon this round, then we're going to have to do that. So what have we got on the bottom that can kill a Night Demon? Uh, force one enemy within range four to perform a move one. Uh, we, they're out of range currently, otherwise we could move them onto a trap, which would kill them. So we're looking at the bottom. Force one enemy within range 5 to perform an attack 2, targeting another enemy with you controlling the action. It's probably not going to be enough to kill. Uh, okay, so we wanted to, yeah, do a non-attack source of damage, which is a trap. So I'm guessing the game is pushing us to use uh, this. Force one enemy within range 4 to perform a move 1. So we want to go late in the round so we can give them a chance to move to us so they come within range. Because if they don't move within range, then we're not going to be able to use this. Uh, so Gnawing Horde and then Parasitic Influence. And hopefully they're moving. Yes, they are. Move four. Two, three. God. Okay. damage. Okay, Mind Thieves turn. So, force one enemy within range four to perform a move, one with me controlling the action. So, 
you are going in there. Goodbye. And we will summon you uh, there. Now your final objective, kill the remaining Night Demons. One of the Mind Thief's signature traits is access to cards with augment abilities, such as Withering Claw. While active, these grant persistent buffs to her melee attacks, but she can normally only have one augment active at a time. They handily always come with an attack attached to, in addition to setting up the augment. Okay. Uh, unfortunately, I'm not in a position to do an attack where I am. I should have moved. It would have been better to move that one onto there the rat there and then I could have attacked next go without moving uh, but I'm sure the game is being kind to me so empathic assault attack 4 range 5 that will work as well and then the bottom uh, do we need to kill them all this turn I'm assuming not horse 1 enemy within range 5 to form an attack 2 targeting another enemy Uh, what the, what's the rat space stats, actually? Oh, attacks apply poison as well. Which increases the damage dealt by any attack. Attack 2. So the rat will attack this for 2. Anything on the bottom that can do 1 damage rain. Uh, yeah, we could force the other enemy to attack that one. So, Submissive Affliction. But they are going before us. They are super fast! Did not kill our rat, which is good. No, zero damage. Okay, but did apply poison. Uh, and so yeah, we add plus one to our, all of our attacks against a poisoned character. Heals, cure, poison, but no other effect. Okay, so we are going to first of all do... Uh, this to force... That to do an attack on that. Oh no, minus one. Oh, okay, didn't kill. Uh, fine, well then we'll do an attack on that with our top. Rat's tanking for us anyway, which is fine. Um, scary, move three, attack one. Then we could do withering claw. Scurry, no, scurry is the top. Withering claw, the augment is the top as well. Um, we could probably just do a standard move and a standard attack, actually. So let's just pick our fastest card. This time we are going before the demon. And the rat finished it off anyway. Okay. We're done. I guess I'll do a loot too. Um, and a loot one. Three. I guess you can too. I guess you too can consider yourself a demon slayer now, huh? Or was it demon hunter? Whatever the point is. Well done. Well, that is all of the tutorials for Gloomhaven. So that is the basics of how to play the game. 